Good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm Stacia Bensel. I'm the treasurer of Japan Studies Association. And I've got the pleasure of introducing my friend and my colleague, Bill Tsutsui. You all have information about Bill's academic, administrative, and advisory posts, as well as his publications. So I think my real purpose today is to tell folks about Bill's relationship with JSA and to let you in on some of the great things he does that support Japanese studies and scholars. Bill's the president of Ottawa University, so he's practically in my backyard now. Um, he also sits on the advisory board for Japan Studies Association, and he's been generous in his support of the organization. When he was president of Hendricks College, he hosted Japan Studies Association for a wonderful workshop, and he even let us take photos in front of his inflatable Godzilla. Bill's multifaceted in his scholarship. You can ask Bill almost anything about Japanese history or contemporary culture. He has the mark in my book anyway of the consummate academician. He's comfortable saying what he does not know and he'll eagerly point you in the direction of places to find out, probably getting as excited as you are in the discovery process. You never know where Bill will pop up. On 311, I, like many of us, was listening to the latest news about the disaster. I'd stepped into the other room when I heard an unmistakable voice coming from my television. It was Bill being interviewed by CNN. I was quite impressed. <laughs> Lest you think Bill lets being interviewed by an international news agency about one of the greatest disasters of all time go to his head, I welcome you to visit his YouTube cover of Keisha's Godzilla. <laughs> Bill's usually up for anything. What sets Bill apart from other academics is that he is up for anything. He treats those of us who are not experts on Japan as equals. He mentors us, and he always, always finds dynamic topics to explore or finds dynamic approaches to well-visited topics. Listening to Bill speak is a treat. If anybody can hypothesize about the future of Japanese studies, it's Bill. And he's put together an excellent panel of equally talented folks whom I will have him introduce to help us discuss this. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much, Stacia. That was the sweetest introduction I have ever gotten. That's why I love the JSA. Uh, what, a, uh, what a wonderful way uh, to start. You probably can see me blushing. Well, good afternoon, good morning. Thank you all for being here today. It is a pleasure to be back at another uh, JSA conference. Although needless to say, it's a shame we cannot all be gathered on a lanai holding fruity drinks with little umbrellas in them a block away from the beach in Honolulu. Next year, I hope. I want to thank all the folks at JSA who made this roundtable discussion today possible. Uh, Stacia, uh, of course, Joe, Faye, Andrea, Don, Maggie, Jim, and Paul. Uh, Paul was the one who first raised to me the possibility uh, of putting together a panel like this for the conference this year. It is always a joy and an inspiration to work with you, and it pains me not to have seen any of you in person in two years. JSA conferences are always so friendly, so welcoming, collegial, so laid back, not to mention engaging, informative, and just plain fun. Now, don't get me wrong, Zoom is very convenient, and huge kudos to the thanks at Johnson County, to the folks at Johnson County Community College, just up the road from where I am now, who got the technology all wrangled for this event. I would much rather be meeting virtually than not at all, but I miss not being in a room full of Japan experts in Aloha shirts and flip-flops at the beginning of January. So to get right into it, uh, the future of Japan studies. I think all of us are only too well aware that these are tough times for the academic world in general and for the humanities, humanistic social sciences, and the liberal arts in particular. The pandemic may have heightened the sense of crisis that many of us feel, but concerns over the future of disciplines like English and art history and philosophy, not to mention the teaching of languages like Latin and German, are of much, much longer standing. Every week, it seems, brings news of another degree program being closed, 
another group of faculty being laid off, another set of statistics showing the poor prospects for PhDs seeking tenure track appointments. These are tough times as well for area studies. That is to say, for those of us who focus on particular world regions like East Asia or Latin America, and on particular nations and cultures like Russia or Japan. In a post-Cold War globalized world where the geopolitical divisions and tensions that drove interest in area studies and catalyzed significant government investment in building international expertise have apparently faded from the public and national agenda, academic programs like Southeast Asian studies and Eastern European studies seem to be struggling to find enrollments, support in dean's offices, and financial resources for research and teaching. It seems that every time I look on social media, which is less and less often for the sake of my own sanity, I see friends bemoaning degree programs being shuttered, language programs under threat, and specialist library collections being slashed. Of course, not all is doom and gloom. Japanese language study, and Korean as well, are relative bright spots. As the MLA's excellent statistics have shown, Japanese and Korean were the only two of the 15 most studied world languages in America to show positive growth in post-secondary enrollments between 2013 and 2016, which is the last time a national study was undertaken. This is great news, of course, but even these numbers are a little bittersweet. The number of American learners of Japanese may indeed have been up in 2016 from 2013, but was actually down from the previous survey in 2009. Now, I hope I don't insult anyone by saying that we academics have a tendency to be obsessive hand ringers and default pessimists. We are a profession rich in chicken littles, ready to assume the sky is falling, and prone to see that proverbial glass as half empty. Humanists have been bemoaning the decline of the humanities, I think, for as long as we've had universities, disciplines, and doctoral degrees. That being said, especially when you look at the trauma of the job market and the struggles of precarious contingent faculty and the pressure on most of us to seemingly endlessly justify our courses, our programs, and our very selves on our campuses, it generally, genuinely does seem that there is a real cause for concern today in the academy and in our society for many scholarly fields, including Japan studies. At the 2019 Association for Asian Studies Conference, which seems like a very long time ago now, since it was our last in-person conference in Denver, a panel with the very deliberately provocative title, The Death of Japan Studies, attracted tremendous attention. I don't think I've ever been to another AIS panel where people were sitting on the floor and the hotel staff had to turn folks away due to the fire code. Organized by John Treat and featuring speakers from a wide range of ages and specializations from the US, Canada, Australia, and Europe, the panel surveyed the many challenges facing Japan studies. The geopolitical rise of China, the decline of area studies, the appearance of new theoretical paradigms, the woes of the job market, and the obsolescence of a field that seems rooted in now dated post-World War II mindsets, Cold War mentalities, and cool Japan fantasies. Japan studies, the unavoidable takeaway that day was, is seriously in trouble. In 2020, Paula Curtis, a medieval historian now at UCLA, organized an AAS panel called, also provocatively, the rebirth of Japanese studies that subsequently due to the pandemic and the cancellation of the AAS conference was presented as an innovative virtual roundtable. And you can still visit that roundtable online at prcurtis.com. The lineup of speakers was heavy on early career scholars 
and included Mindy Landek, who is with us today. And the online format allowed for a very extensive, varied, and rich range of feedback from dozens of experts in the field. As the introduction to that virtual roundtable stated, and I'll quote here, the 2019 Death of Japanese Studies panel began an important dialogue on issues facing Japan-related scholars and educators, particularly as the field has evolved in response to geopolitical and intellectual circumstances. Junior scholars face new and pressing challenges that require a fundamental reconceptualization of the Japan of our work, how institutional concerns alter the contours and security of our positions, and what the implications of these changes are on the survival of the field. How can we approach the present transformations in more inclusive and diverse ways that address the rise of a new kind of Japanese and Asian studies more broadly, even as the support for and from the academy is in decline. Now, both the death panel and the rebirth roundtable were, for me at least, and I think for a whole lot of other people who have dedicated their lives to Japan studies, thoroughly compelling, extremely thought-provoking, occasionally discomforting and even disturbing, and undeniably important landmarks for our field. And while I do not aspire to calling forth all those same emotions today with this panel discussion, I did hope when I started thinking about this event to tap into some of that energy and churn in Japan studies that the panel and the roundtable sparked and channeled and to broaden the conversation, bringing in the wonderful and committed community of the JSA. The title of this discussion today is intentionally completely anodyne. The death of Japan studies panel was less dark than its title suggested. The rebirth of Japanese studies roundtable was less rosy than its title suggested. The future of Japan studies, I hope, is open-ended uh, and framed neither as a post-mortem nor as a clarion call for a renaissance, and so hopefully will allow us to range widely, think broadly, and dream a bit as we look together into the murky crystal ball of where our field might go. When I started thinking of who should be a part of this discussion today, three people immediately came to mind as my dream team, Japan specialists from a range of institutions, disciplines, and career stages. I had heard each of these scholars speak before about the state of Japan studies, and I was impressed that they were all positive and forward-looking in their analyses. That is not to say uncritical or Pollyanna-ish in their outlooks, but focused on opportunities, solutions, and growth. They were, in short, glass half full types. Whatever the appropriate opposite of chicken little is, that was them. Maybe they were all chicken bigs. So back in December, I emailed each of these three scholars and asked them to be part of the panel today. Within 12 hours, they had all enthusiastically agreed. That is the fastest I have ever put together a conference panel and was one of the few times in my career that I have gotten all affirmative responses to such invitations. Now, partly that's because Christine, Mindy, and Morgan are great people, but it's also, I think, because of the timeliness and importance of the topic and because of the opportunity to discuss the future of our field with all of you in the JSA community, which I see as an absolutely critical group for the continued dynamism and expansion of Japan studies down the road. So the plan for today is that after I introduce our panelists, they will each speak for 10 to 15 minutes. After the presentations are done, I will throw out some opening questions to everyone, and then we will take questions and comments from the audience. Please put questions and comments in the chat box at any time during the panel. If you hear something in one of the talks and have a question, drop it in there. Then I will monitor them and collect them to pose to the group at the end. Now for our panelists. Mindy Landek is a recently, and I would stress 
recently in terms of a few months uh, or weeks ago, tenured and promoted associate professor of East Asian studies at Austin College, which is a wonderful private liberal arts college north of Dallas in Sherman, Texas, not in Austin. It is with considerable pride that I claim Mindy as a former student, although honestly, I learned more from her than I ever taught her. She holds her PhD from the University of Kansas, Rock Chalk Jayhawk, and I had the honor and pleasure of working with her there before I headed south to a job in Texas. Mindy, as you'll hear, has a deep commitment to Japanese studies outreach and to public facing scholarship, including a long history of working with the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia on curriculum creation and professional development initiatives which I am thinking means she has a lot in common with many members of the audience today, and of serving as a reader for the AP Japanese language and culture exams. Her dissertation and her research focus on tea ceremony practice, politics, and material culture in early modern Japan. And her teaching is incredibly wide ranging, running from Japanese language, history, and culture courses to the wonderful world of Japanese yokai, supernatural spirits and creatures. Morgan Patelka is chair of the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies and professor of history at UNC Chapel Hill. Like Mindy, he knows small liberal arts colleges well, graduating from Oberlin and serving on the faculty at Occidental College before going to Carolina. His PhD is from Princeton, and I think we just missed each other in graduate school there. He's a leading historian of late medieval and early modern Japan, with deep expertise on the samurai, tea culture, ceramics, cities, and material culture. He is also a disgustingly prolific scholar who puts the rest of us to shame. And I cannot even begin to list all his books here, but they include Japanese tea culture, art, history, and practice, spectacular accumulation, material culture, Tokugawa Ieyasu, and samurai sociability, and his latest, Reading Medieval Ruins, Urban Life and Destruction in 16th Century Japan, soon to be published by Cambridge. He's won Watson, Fulbright, NEH, and National Humanities Center Fellowships. He serves as the co-editor of the Journal of Japanese Studies and is on the Japan Foundation American Advisory Committee. He is also a seasoned administrator and prodigious fundraiser, having served as the founding director of the Triangle Center for Japanese Studies from 2011 to 13, and is director of the Carolina Asia Center from 2013 to 19. Last but not least will be Christine Yano, who very likely needs no introduction here. A professor of anthropology at the University of Hawaii, she is one of a small handful of the very leading scholars in Japanese studies and in Japanese American studies in the United States. She is also, I would say, having known her for quite a while now, one of the most generous, encouraging, approachable, and unpretentious scholars of her stature in the world. In 2020 to 2021, she was the president of the Association for Asian Studies and continues to serve on the board of directors there. And since 2018 has been chair of the Japan Foundation's American Advisory Committee. Christine's research has been wide ranging, spanning popular music, beauty contests, fan clubs, flight attendants, and material culture, timely and influential, but has also been wonderfully accessible and just downright fun. Her books take up about half a shelf in my office and include Tears of Longing, Nostalgia, and the Nation in Japanese Popular Song, Crowning the Nice Girl, Gender, Ethnicity, and Culture in Hawaii's Cherry Blossom Festival, Airborne Dreams, Nisei Stewardesses, and Pan American World Airways, Pink Globalization, Hello Kitty and its trek across the Pacific, and most recently, Straight A's, Asian American college students in their own words. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be here with these uh, wonderful panelists. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Mindy. Thank you, Bill, for that typically effusive um, introduction. and. You know, I will say it is never an enviable task to follow you on a slate of speakers. <laughs> um, the fear of being um, 
humbled uh, among such illustrious company as my fellow panelists today is very real. Uh, but I'm delighted to have been invited and I know that there are other people in the session that are friends of mine. Hello to all of you. Um, my name is Mindy Landick and Austin College is a small private liberal arts college in North Texas. We are literally a stone's throw from the Red River and the Oklahoma uh, state line. And so uh, uh, I'm really pleased to join this group today and to think through some of these issues that I know concern us all together. Um, Bill has, of course, already highlighted a number of the challenges which face us as uh, scholars of Japanese studies. I took the uh, I took the liberty of compiling my own laundry list here, and I imagine that these issues and many and sundry others will emerge uh, multiple times in our conversations this afternoon. But again, um, at the risk of being Pollyanna-ish, I don't think I am. I, he, Bill is right to identify me as a glass half full kind of person. And so instead of focusing on these, these issues of scale, uh, around which it's very difficult as an individual faculty member to know what can I really do? What can my institution really do? I do think that we have some answers along those lines to think about and explore together, but I'd like to just actually uh, use this portion of my time to think through four um, so ideas or uh, sort of prongs of, of attention and response uh, to these concerns that have been a part of my career path over the last five years here at Austin College. Um, so the first point that I would like to make is that, um, yes, yes, we are all um, excellent hang, hang ringer, hand ringers, uh, but it's too soon, I think, to really clutch our pearls around the ways in which uh, Japan as a focus of study for both our students on campus as well as the general public at large of, of a focus of interest um, is being diminished by, for example, the, the rising wave of uh, South Korean popular culture or previous to that of the emergence of China under the world stage as a major economic player a few, like a decade ago. Um, Japan continues to be compelling for a number of audiences and these do of course include our our students and the general public at large. So the first point I'd like to make is that we should take some comfort, rightly so, in the enduring appeal of Japan. Just as Isabella Bird and Lafcardio Hearn were attracted to um, the rich culture and history of Japan, just as most of us in this room were drawn to Japan as a focus of study uh, during the course of our own education, um, students continue to be drawn by Japan. And when I have um, taken my presentation of topics surrounding Japanese culture or history, off campus to other groups, what I have found is that there's a tremendous uh, response um, from the general public. People are curious, people are interested. Um, and this need not be limited solely to the sort of stereotypical icons, if we want to think about samurai, geisha, or dare I say it, even Godzilla, Hello Kitty, perhaps. Um, I would like us to sort of rethink that um, the problematic, what I think might be perceived as the problematic nature of those things becoming the icon, iconic draws to Japanese culture and understand that they are opportunities to deepen the conversation, to open the door, and then to invite new populations, new audiences in to an investigation of Japan um, along a number of different disciplinary lines. And what I have found is that um, when I open the door that way and extend the invitation, the response is always wonderful. So with that in mind, I would like to talk a little bit about public facing, the, the opportunity presented by public facing scholarship. Um, opportunities that we have either as faculty members and as experts in our field, or in collaboration with our own students to reach out beyond the walls of our institutions and to try to engage our communities in a, um, a welcoming exploration of topics in Japanese studies as an introduction to our field. 
So as Bill has mentioned, um, my introduction to doing this kind of work stems to a period of employment in the early aughts with the Program for Teaching East Asia and the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia. Um, I have not been formally full-time employed by I, any of these organizations since uh, 2006, but my collaboration with them has actually continued to the present day. Um, and I, he has deeply informed the way that I personally have developed as an educator. So the fact that our audiences are not limited to the classroom settings alone, I think is a really key point for us to think through how do we revitalize and preserve the field of Japanese studies. Um, we have many opportunities, there's many venues in which people are willing and um, able to hear more about Japan. Libraries, civic organizations, the kinds of work with in-service teachers that is undertaken by the NEH or NCTA, and even local businesses and other communities um, in which we are embedded are very open to this. Um, I've been doing this kind of work for a long time, um, you know, but I think in recent years I have become much more intentional about it. And then with the arrival of the pandemic in 2020 um, and my first introduction and foray into using Zoom as a tool, I realized that it wasn't even geographically limiting anymore. I didn't have to be able to physically travel uh, to a business or a library in the Dallas area. I could, I could actually get online and share with people uh, from a global <laughs> community um, that gathered virtually. So um, opportunities like to partner with, for example, businesses. I taught a course in 2019 on tea in East Asia. I partnered with a number of tea sellers and tea businesses in the Dallas Metroplex, right, and was able to um, have owners and experts come and visit my classroom and then in exchange I would come and do programs in their stores. Um, during the pandemic I also I happened to be married to a public librarian that provided me easy access to do public programs um, over Zoom uh, for library audiences. So there are a number of these kinds of opportunities that are there if we just simply put ourselves forward, you'll find that the response is often very um, enthusiastically welcoming. There's no money in it, right? But, uh, but, uh, but essentially, I, I look at this as an investment in my sort of portfolio as an educator of more than just undergraduates. And I've gotten my students involved in such endeavors too. Even pre-pandemic, um, I would often have students accompany me to run programs that they would design and put together logistically and then execute uh, at public libraries for children, such as our Passport to East Asia days that we've done twice through the McKinney libraries or my Tea in Japan course in 2019, the culminating activity of that hands-on experiential learning course here on campus was to offer a tea open house for the entire campus and surrounding communities here in North Texas. These were rich experiences, not just for me as an educator, but more so for my students who learned how to articulate what they had learned um, and share that with, with others um, in through these events. So I think public facing scholarship, especially uh, scholarship that can leverage this kind of deep engagement, um, again, introducing people to Asian culture, or specifically to Japanese culture, are tremendously important and are provide us with one relatively accessible avenue by which we can continue to make our content important and, and show its salience. Um, another facet of this, I think, is being willing to step outside of one's own specific research niche. And I'll be honest, I, mean, I don't think that our graduate education really emphasizes this. Um, my own graduate education was really about developing and cultivating expertise in one fairly narrowly defined area, right? And then really focusing in on that. I mean, that's a natural, I think, assumption or predilection that we develop um, in the course of our training. But as a sort of educator doing the job day to day, what I've understood is that there can be considerable rewards to be reaped from stepping outside of that narrowly defined uh, you know, area of my expertise. So Bill had mentioned that I have been recently been getting involved with yokai studies. 
this is this was never a focus of mine in any of my educational training. Uh, this came about in 2017 as I taught my first first year seminar for incoming freshmen here on campus. And I wanted a theme, a topic that was be fun for young people. So I chose Japanese animals and Japanese history and culture. Um, and that led me to do a, a sort of subunit, right, within that on yokai, sort of fantastical animals or supernatural animals. But uh, this provoked a kind of domino effect. So when, I, when I'm saying we should get out of our niches or try getting out of our niches, this is what happened when I did that for the first time. That led to an invitation to run an, a nationally distributed seminar, webinar, uh, through the Five Colleges Center. Um, which I did uh, after first kind of resisting that because again this is not I'm not an ex this is my, my area of expertise my first reaction was to point the director to five other people who I felt had expertise that I did not possess but she made an excellent point which was they were not willing or available to do this webinar I however was and um, and I, I realized that sometimes the greater good is understanding when you are the expert vis-a-vis -vis the audience um, to go ahead and take a chance, right? So this is what happened from that when that one unit turned into a webinar. That turned into a public pandemic program, which turned into a three-week intensive summer course for the first summer of the pandemic. My enrollments went up as students from that summer course wanted to join all of our regular semester EAS courses. I then transformed that into an on-campus Jan term for the subsequent Jan term session. And now I am currently thinking through and beginning to plan a 2025 um, trip with students to Japan to just to, that's themed around yokai uh, on site in Japan and who knows where it will go from here. So this is just an example of how that in one case that approach has personally uh, reaped dividends for me. My, my fourth point would be to channel the vocational emphasis to our advantage. Now one thing I think we all have done some justified hang, hang, hand wringing over in recent years is the sort of corporatization of the university and the increasing uh, tendency to view education as as preparatory preparation for the you know basically entering the workforce. Um, this is good and bad. I, I tend to think we're not going to be able to individually change that. There are things we can do systemically to address it, but is there some aspect of this vocational emphasis that can be turned to the advantage of area studies programs, specifically Japanese studies? And this is something I'm actually very excited about. This is a kind of coming to fruition just now at our institution is this idea that there is a way to revitalize humanities fields by focusing on the process of professionalization that adequately prepares students for the job market. Like many places, we have watched the number of majors that we have in East Asian studies programs or Japanese dwindle over the years as especially since 20, 2008 we found that more and more students particularly first gen students of which we have a large number at austin college come in with their parents and them very laser focused on what kind of a job am i going to be able to get right out the gate post-graduation uh, and we know that these the trajectory for humanities majors is actually very good if we look five years out, 10 years out from graduation, but that sort of first initial job or two or three that students are able to win right out of college maybe does not look as lucrative or as secure uh, to parents who are considering spending their savings on putting a child through, through college. Um, so one thing we're trying to do is to make the process of professionalization and, and critical thinking that we know happens in our classrooms more overtly visible to both students um, and their parents. So this happens both at the point of recruitment when they come into the college, but more importantly, in the way that we structure, set up, and teach a class um, we are developing these models that we're calling humanities labs that highlight these key skills, these core skills that we know employer, major employers like Google find desirable. 
and giving students the language to articulate the way that the assignments and the way that we are designing them allows them to um, to develop expertise in these transferable skills. So I think um, when it comes to the this kind of vocational emphasis that we're seeing in higher ed, Japanese studies is well situated to sort of think about the ways in which our content can actually be put to work on specific skills like collaborative problem solving, um, like communicating ideas effectively, right, or making ethical decisions. Um, so this is a, an initiative uh, we're very close around the cusp of uh, kicking off a major multi-year project which will actually carry this across the humanities and social sciences divisions at our college and i'm happy to talk more about that uh, so these are just a few of the things i want i'm looking forward to discussing with the group and uh, i'm eager to hear what christine and morgan have to add to this the, the conversation first thank you Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Morgan. Uh, thank you so much to Bill for putting this together and for the really um, embarrassing and generous introduction. Uh, thank you, Mindy, for that fascinating, stimulating talk. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint today. I want to speak to you a little more sort of off the cuff about uh, a few um, uh, observations that I've made about where Japanese studies is and where I think it's going. Um, these are based, of course, on my own lived experiences, my career, um, and that career, which has ping-ponged back across the country, um, has, has, for me, really illuminated how differentiated our experience of engaging with Japanese studies is depending on type of institution, which I think is something that we've already talked about, but also based on geography. Um, obviously, the United States and Canada, um, these, are, these are huge countries with uh, incredibly um, distinct demographies and cultures, uh, state by state, region by region. Um, and so my first job was teaching at Occidental College which is a liberal arts college in Los Angeles. Um, and, and obviously that's home to one of the largest, perhaps the largest Asian American population in the United States, um, a part of the country that has a, a deep, historically rich connection to Japan, um, a vibrant, um, powerful community of Japanese Americans. Uh, and so teaching Japanese studies at Oxy meant that I never had to answer the question, why Japan? I never had to um, sort of uh, rationalize my field or, or, or stick up for the vibrancy or relevance of Japan in the world. It really was taken for granted. I had so many Asian American students in my classes, uh, many Japanese American students, many who were um, still maintaining connections to family in Japan. Um, the, uh, the location allowed me to do collaborations with the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, which has an incredible collection of Japanese art, um, as well as with the Japanese American National Museum, um, a really remarkable institution um, that uh, works on obviously the, the history of Japanese Americans, but also on issues related to um, civil rights. Uh, and um, those kinds of connections make the, the vibrancy of Japanese studies manifest in people's lives on the ground every day in a way that as a teacher, was, it was low hanging fruit. It was wonderful. Um, and, and in some senses, it was, it was easy because I could learn from my students who were coming into the classroom from neighborhoods, from families, with these long um, complex histories connected to and engaged with Japan. So when I moved to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2010, um, you know, the landscape was very different. North Carolina does not have the kind of historic connection to Japan that California does. Um, it is, I think in many ways, a less explicitly globally engaged part of the country. 
Um, obviously, that's changing. Um, migration um, is changing that. There are, there are more people moving into North Carolina than moving out of it. A lot of those people are, are of Asian heritage or Asian American. Um, there are a lot of big multinational businesses that have set up shop in North Carolina, including some Japanese companies. So I don't, I don't want to erase that um, reality or imply that there's a kind of static regionalism here. Um, but the truth is, there is always the question, why Japan? And that has been a challenge that I have actually really appreciated because it has forced me to be reflexive and to uh, not take things for granted that frankly, when I was in the, the Japanese history PhD program at Princeton, I could take for granted because everyone around me cared about Japan and everyone around me studied Japanese, uh, Japanese history, Japanese culture. And at that time, I think it's different now, but at that time we didn't ask why study Japan. Um, we, we all were, were to some extent uh, united in the same kind of mission and shared passion. Uh, and, and I think that that is one of the many ways in which our field is changing and has to continue changing, that we no longer can make assumptions about uh, the applicability, the relevance, and the, even the, the kind of attractiveness of Japan and Japanese studies. It is incumbent on everyone who teaches or researches uh, or wants to engage with Japan in higher education to foreground the question why and to provide a coherent and hopefully exciting answer. Um, that answer has got to be aimed at students, but it also is for parents, it's for communities, it's for administrators, it's for funders, uh, it's for all the kind of stakeholders in higher ed. And because higher ed is so politicized, it even is for um, uh, the, the diverse you know, population of Americans and Canadians who um, are asking hard questions about why it matters to go to university in the first place, um, which Mindy already talked about in terms of the crisis of the humanities. But I think putting it even more, more explicitly, um, in our culture at this moment, people are really questioning the value of universities as institutions. Um, and um, I, I would never suggest that any of you in the, in the audience here today would dismiss those questions. Um, but I do think that's one possible answer. And uh, in Japanese studies, we need to engage in those conversations. And I think we can. I think Japan has good answers. Um, so at UNC Chapel Hill, one of the things I discovered was that although there was not the same history of engagement with Japan and uh, investment in Japanese studies that there was on the West Coast, um, and one of the things that I like to tell my colleagues is that uh, Asian studies at at the University of California at Berkeley started in the 1890s and at UNC Chapel Hill, it started in the 1990s. Um, and that that meant we had a lot of ground to make up. Um, on the other hand, what it means is that the, the families and students in the state of North Carolina have been deprived the opportunity to learn a, about Japan at their flagship state university um, for a century, uh, right? I mean, that's, it's, that's it's slightly hyperbolic, but to make the point that this is not a critique of the state or the region, but an expression of opportunity, that this is a moment uh, when Japanese studies scholars and teachers can um, meet student demand that hasn't been met before, uh, I think is incredibly exciting. And you feel that in the classroom every day at Chapel Hill. Uh, students, um, we, we overwhelmingly serve students from North Carolina. We are capped uh, at 78% um, of our student population undergrad has to be from uh, North Carolina. So unlike a lot of big public universities that have let more and more students in out of state or internationally at UNC Chapel Hill, we're really still overwhelmingly focused on the mission of serving um, the residents of the state of North Carolina. I have students come in all the time who are just so thrilled to be in college, who are so thrilled to have the chance to study Japan and who never thought they would get there. Um, and they did through their unbelievable hard work and intelligence. And they want to study Japanese. They want to learn about Japanese history and culture, about the applicability of Japan. They want me to help them figure out, well, am I going to be, get a, be able to get a job? Am I going to be able to 
uh, work with companies that need international skills? How does Japan help me to answer all those questions? Um, that is uh, a, a vibrant possibility filled opportunity for me as a teacher that I really um, try to embrace every day. Um, fortunately, we have seen enrollments in Japanese language uh, continue to be extremely strong. Uh, and I think in part that's because Japanese studies doesn't have um, the kind of saturation in the Southeast that it does uh, on the West Coast and the Northeast. So um, people don't have that many opportunities to study Japan and, uh, and Japanese. And so when they get to UNC Chapel Hill and they, they see that as an opportunity, they jump at it. Um, we continue to have uh, really diverse classrooms um, in some parts of the country. Uh, Japanese enrollments have maintained a certain level partially through the influx of international students and a lot of international students from Asia, fortunately are really interested in taking Japanese. Um, but that also means that those classrooms sometimes start to look kind of lopsided. Uh, that hasn't true. Uh, that hasn't been true at UNC Chapel Hill. So the kind of representativeness uh, in terms of, uh, you know, racial and ethnic identities of the university is reflected in the Japanese language and Japanese studies classrooms. Um, so we have a lot of um, uh, African-American students uh, from uh, Eastern North Carolina, from the cities of North Carolina who are coming to UNC Chapel Hill and taking Japanese and loving it. Um, there's been a fear that Korean studies would draw away everyone from Japanese that hasn't had. Both have, have, have grown without poaching from each other, which I think is a real possibility uh, for, for many institutions. Uh, and for me, most importantly, the university has continued to support uh, my department, Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, including uh, Japanese. Now, they, they, we are run by bean counters. So if the numbers start to slip drastically, uh, I don't know what will happen to that support. But I think they've been partners in our efforts to maintain um, the, the, the classes, the range of classes that we provide, which in a chicken and egg fashion helps to keep students interested and keep them coming in through the door. Um, sometimes student demand wanes, but sometimes the institutional support wanes and that leads to a decline in student demand. And I think we need to really um, keep a fire lit under the, the tails of our administrators to make sure that they don't withdraw support from Japanese uh, studies, however, however we can. The one area where I have seen a decline that worries me is that when uh, great scholars of Japanese studies have retired, they have not been replaced. Um, we have lost brilliant uh, Japanese studies scholars uh, like Jim White in political science, a real pioneer in the study of Japan, um, Miles Fletcher in the history department, Jan Bardsley in Asian studies uh, and others. And what often happens is that those lines go to thematic positions instead of Japan focused positions. So a Japanese historian retires and then we have a search for a historian of imperialism. Now, in theory, that could go to a historian of Japan, but all too often it goes to a British historian or someone who works on a part of the world that is a little more legible uh, for, um, for our, uh, our non-Japan focused colleagues. Um, that uh, then leads me to a question of, you know, what is the future of Japanese studies? And I've, I've talked too long already probably, so I'll try to keep this short. I think a lot of these questions will be addressed in the chat, um, but I'll just say that uh, I'm very optimistic about the future of Japanese studies. I see the field as a whole reorienting itself to be much more global uh, in its mindset and in the way that it understands the importance of Japan in the past and in the present, that we are no longer studying a, a small island nation with four distinct seasons as though it existed out in the middle of the Pacific with no connection to the rest of the world. Instead, we're studying Japan in East Asia, Japan in the Pacific, Japan and the world. Uh, and that makes the relevance of our teaching and our research all the, all the clearer. Um, I also see uh, everywhere um, a, a willingness to embrace the uh, applicability of Japanese studies in STEM. And I think that this is not a um, sign that our uh, value uh, as a humanistic field is declining. I think it is a broadening of the, the kind of possibility space of our teaching and research. I'm a historian of pre-modern Japan 
and I'm growing more and more interested in environmental history. And so I'm now reading um, research by geologists in Japan. Uh, in the past, I've done a lot of work with archeologists. To me, that doesn't mean I'm walking away from the humanities. My love of art, of the tea ceremony will never die, but it means that I'm embracing new partnerships and trying to think about certain historical problems from new angles and new directions. And I think that's something that everyone in Japanese studies can fruitfully do. It doesn't mean that we're giving up. It means that we are looking for new partnerships and new ways to attract students into our classrooms. Um, a lot of students want to be pre-health. They want to be pre-engineering. And Japanese studies is a great fit for those fields. And we, I think, need to do a better job of making that clear through programming, through speakers, through workshops, through training, through advising, and through our own teaching and publications. Um, let's see, looking at my notes, um, uh, there are other things that I wanna talk about, but I think they'll come up in the chat or in the question rather. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to the chat where I see there are a few questions. Thank you for the chance to talk with you today. Um, and I look forward uh, to the rest of our conversation. I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, Christine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, both, both of you, um, uh, Mindy and Morgan, for, for really throwing down the gauntlet and, and, and energizing, I think, our conversation here, and Bill for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, too, for, um, for GSA, for continuing to do what you do, which is such important work um, involving people at community colleges and people at, at a, a whole variety of levels. So I appreciate this opportunity. And indeed, um, you know, as Bill says, we are people whose glass is half full, or at least that's our perspective, that it's half full. Um, and let me just bring in, in the same way that Mindy and Morgan um, really found, you know, grounded their, what they had to say, their remarks by their kinds of professional and some personal backgrounds, I think it is important to frame all of what we say in this way um, and I, so just the perspectives from which I'm, I'm speaking, and these perspectives are rather recent within my career. Um, so as, as Bill mentioned, I am the past president of AES and, um, and an officer from 2019 to 2023. And the, the year in which I was president was, was quite a year. <laughs> um, it started off with, um, with the cancellation of the AAS conference because of COVID. So it started with COVID and COVID is still with us. Um, so, you know, it's, um, it, it, it's a year of pandemics certainly, but it's a year of so much turmoil and, and so many, uh, here's a glass half full opportunities <laughs> to think about our field, to think about it critically, to think how can we make a difference it was a year of Black Lives Matter, which, in, which affected Asian studies and the Association for Asian Studies quite directly with a call from some of our membership for call for the organization to be more responsive and, and to be more, what shall I say, aware of different kinds of experiences, um, especially from minority population. It was a year of anti-Asian racism which we had to really try to address in as most direct a way as possible. It affected many of our members. Um, and it was a year in which I, I personally took um, as a kind of platform, and this preceded the pandemic, but, the, uh, but as a kind of platform, the notion of, of global Asias, which I will get to. So expanding the notion of Asia beyond a static model and really um, in embedding Asia and therefore Japan within uh, a model that's really geared to flow and inter interconnectivity. Um, it was a year in which as president, you have to give keynote speeches. Um, although I didn't travel to give most of those keynote speeches, um, what, I, what the opportunity afforded me that of being in conversation, even if some of that conversation is virtual, but conversation with different parts of the United States, as well as this is pre-pandemic with Bangkok, with AAS in Asia. Um, Morgan and, and Bill also mentioned my involvement with the American Advisory Committee for Japan Foundation 
and I will gladly say that I, I've been chair and Morgan will be the next chair of this American Advisory Committee. I take the responsibility, not lightly, but, but really with a great deal of seriousness um, and give credit to Japan Foundation for even having such a committee so that this American Advisory Committee is really tasked with advising. And they, in general, they, they, they do listen to us and they listen to our concerns. Um, they aren't always able to act on the many concerns that we express to them, but they listen. And I think that's, that's impressive and it's important. And it's important for all of you out there to understand that um, Japan Foundation is, um, has an ear, I think, to the various kinds of needs of um, the scholars for who, who depend so heavily upon this kind of support. Um, so the, my view of Japan studies is based in, um, I, I guess, a couple of ways in which you can look at it. One would be the kind of dynamism which, um, in which movement flows, interconnectivity is a given, that kind of dynamism. It embraces environmental concerns, global health concerns in which we are very much enmeshed, um, pop cultural concerns, um, Bill's work with Godzilla, my work with Hello Kitty, um, refugee concerns, et cetera. Um, so it's that dynamism, but that dynamism is coupled with responsibility and Respond, I'll, I'll be talking more about what I consider a very strong sense of responsibility of Japan studies. Um, so the health, I, I think um, Bill has tasked us to considering the health of Japan studies. And um, I feel that it's contingent upon changing the kinds of frameworks to include maybe a broader, more porous, field than the nation state Japan. And this has been said um, many times over, including today. In a more global approach to Japan studies, that umbrella would also include diaspora studies. So Japanese American, including South American Nikkei. Um, and the framework recognizes the many global elements within geo geopolitical Japan in terms of people, products, sounds, foods, ideas, diseases. And the goal here is not to try to parse out what is Japan versus what is global. The point is to recognize the necessary interpenetration of these categories in everyday lives. It's also important to recognize the work that these categories do historically and contemporaneously. What has it meant, particularly in Japan, to create the categories that which we here uh, today know so well, wa and yo. So um, Japan and something called the West. How, and how have these categories changed over time? Global Japan's, as I will dub it, includes the trans-regional within Asia. So Filipinas in Japan, Japanese expats in Southeast Asia, Okinawans in Osaka, Brazilian Nikkei in Toyota, Zainichi in Tokyo, et cetera, et cetera. So in my research, it has meant expanding the study of, for example, Japan's post-war pop diva, uh, Misora Hibari, to her um, diasporic population in California, Hawaii, Sao Paulo, et cetera, as well as to recognize the degree to which that diasporic fandom contributed to her popularity in Japan. It became part of her star text in Japan. It means following something like a Japanese song, and maybe some of you know it as Sukiyaki, Ue o Muite Aruko, to America's Billboard Top 100 in 1963, and performance by Japanese pop singer Hugh Sakamoto on the Steve Allen Show in that year, tracing its cover performances by groups all over the world from Orientalist renditions to newly configured lyrics in English, Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, da Danish, Swedish, German, French, Czech, Norwegian, Cantonese, and more. So the effect is dizzying, fully recognizing that the original Japanese song has to be seen within these myriad moving contexts of sound, 
imagery, emotion. So this is song as a kind of multi-sensory platform of mobility. And it's the very travels um, that are an essential part of the story. Um, in her recent ethnography of Japanese Brazilians in Japan, entitled Jesus Loves Japan, anthropologist Suma Ikeuchi talks about the kinds of movements that shape global Japans. She writes this, movement does not merely entail a physical change of locations, but also amounts to a temporal, affective, and moral act. Mobility is this fraught with aspirations, anxieties, and ambiguities, end of quote. And it is these aspirations, anxieties, ambiguities that headline the framing of global Japans. And by emphasizing an open, fluid, inclusive, critical approach, global Japans acts as a framework for engagement with social and cultural theory, including critical race studies, as well as engagement with global political concerns, such as indigenous rights, settler colonialism, empire. And these draw on a wider range of perspectives addressing what the many Japans in a global context might mean, do, or say. So the avenues of scholarship opened up by this kind of broader framework that I'm, I'm purporting such as global Japan's extends outward beyond people's lives and concerns and compel us to do so because of these lives and concerns. And it is to these lives amidst um, islands and oceans that I'd like us to turn our attention. And, and many of you know, I am speaking from an island and an ocean. I'm speaking from the island of Oahu, um, the Valley of Manoa within the archipelago of Hawaii situated in the Pacific Ocean. So I speak from that geological um, positioning. And the object of our shared scholarly and cultural gaze, that which brings us together here today in, in the J Japan Studies Association is Japan, comprised of numerous islands in an archipelago in the North Pacific Ocean. And furthermore, the audience that we are gathering here today may be thought of as comprising each separate but connected islands bound more profoundly through our virtual oceanic reach of shared interests. So what I'm proposing today as Global Japan recognizes the significance of the framework of as mobile inhabitants of both islands and oceans, each of our islands has its long history, socio-political, economic context, and the resultant complex of interactions. So we bring each of these to our approach to studying Japan, our own vested interests. And importantly, particularly for addressing concerns of crisis, reorientations, deaths and rebirths, as this round table does, the time has come for us to de develop perhaps our oceanic connections, not erasing differences, but developing new understandings based upon and within them, some of which we have already been hearing, thankfully from Mindy, from Morgan, and from Bill, who has put this together. So if we recognize both the islands and oceans that frame our discussion of global Japans, we recognize the generative possibilities built upon their essential fluidity and connectivity. We think through the seemingly infinite ocean of the digital realm, which too shapes global Japan's, and what oceans and the digital provide as a conceptual framework is circulation, is flow, interconnection, and a respectful amount of indeterminacy. Oceans humble, the human hand, even as the digital might elevate it or suggest its possibilities. And in this, I echo the insights of Karen Amimoto uh, Ingersoll, calling for what she calls a seascape epistemology, that is an approach to knowing presumed on a knowledge of the sea, 
the ocean, which tells one how to move through it, how to approach life and knowing through the movements of the world. Oceans can become our teachers. And that's what I'm suggesting that we do if we let them. Bringing to the fore certain elements, that is movement, circulation, flows, while placing other elements in the background, that is structures, stability, and fixity. Oceans and islands within them call for multiple perspectives, flexible arrangements, and moving target analyses that capture both changing natal home contexts and shifting diasporic living conditions, especially as these may be, may be in conversation with one another. These analyses call us to constantly find the connections between whether we address flying Hello Kitties or global pandemics. An ocean-based epistemology recognizes the place of waves within it, whether observed from afar or involved from within. So waves, riding it, floating above, diving below, tumbling through its forces. To, and, and to push this metaphor a little further, I suggest that we listen to waves as they, they lap, they crash, they roar. Here in Hawaii, we can do that a lot. The sound of waves can be meditative, this kind of hypnotic presence in their regularity, as well as really generating a kind of fear in a crashing roar. They can lull and they can terrify. And their endlessness, reaching perpetual shores over and over again, gives them capacity to weather jagged rocks, grind coral into fine sand, and etch whole shorelines with shapes of their design. They infill space by their presence. So they become this kind of backdrop of near white noise. But, but here's the interesting thing. The sound of waves reflects oftentimes their infrastructural conditions. So in the shallows, their sounds incorporate the materials between, beneath them, that is sand or coral or rocks or some combination of this. The waves of a sandy beach sound different from one comprised of pebbles. The sound of waves is thus always an interaction of multiple conditions from depth of the ocean floor to contact with obstacles to the composition of its base. And I'm, I admit this metaphor may be a little overworked, but, but I think the utility lies in considering historical, social, cultural, economic, political waves as dynamic forces of encounter. The travel, transport, transform, and transfix. Waves constitute the surface expression of currents that run deeply and broadly. And we who live on islands know this, have lived it, have heard these waves differentially as part of our knowing. And in his landmark essay, Our Sea of Islands, Tongan Fijian writer and anthropologist Epeli Haofa draws attention to an ocean-based fluidity that emphasizes mobility and interconnectedness rather than an, another kind of Western-based modernism that conceptualizes the Pacific as scattered and isolated islands. So too, in what I'm suggesting is a global Japan's conceptualization, we might reframe the silos of nation states to emphasize the interconnectedness in and through Japan to global reconfigurations. And in doing so, we not merely acknowledge, but emphasize the dynamic processes of the movement, the mobility, the interaction. So the oceans as metaphor thus is not empty or marginal, but central as an interactive force of flow and global Japan's embraces that flow. And part of that embracing of that flow includes taking kuleana, that is Hawaiian for responsibility as an, an uppermost concern. And here was my second point, right? So mobility and responsibility. So Kuleana, 
binds us together as members of a community of scholarship and concern as we are here today. The ethics of scholarship as researchers of that flow serve to guide us. Global Japan raises important questions embedded within that flow and interaction. What are the critical issues surrounding representation that is endemic to Japan studies? Who may speak for whom, especially within complex settings? What are the ethical challenges of working with and for marginalized racial communities in different parts of Japan and its diaspora? My goal here is to raise questions that might help frame some of the critical issues surrounding Japan studies amid our pandemic era and beyond. And I raise the banner of Global Japan's from islands within an oceanic perspective as a provocation to engage critically with our fields, our practices, our communities, and these communities variously include that where we do our research, where we live, and our careers. And I suggest that Global Japan signals maybe <laughs> a new normal that comprises simultaneously theory and method, islands and oceans, and the intertwining of these kinds of forces. This approach asks that we constantly seek the larger interconnecting frame that has created infrastructures from the past and challenged these through the dynamism of moving populations, goods, ideas, sounds, foods, etc. And most importantly, I see in Global Japan's a path forward that takes Japan studies beyond its past toward a future that assumes mobilities as a framework and thus takes critical approaches to issues such as race, empire, diaspora, minority population, environmental threats, public health, including global pandemics, language loss, and virtual worlds as a given. The village studies upon which our field has cut its eye teeth have become both smaller and bigger at the same time as we recognize the complexity and connectivity that are part of village life. A field such as Okinawan studies develops as it recognizes the many and competing Okinawas therein. As Global Japan's researchers, we involute by connecting more and more intricately the power dynamics of human, human endeavors through this kind of fine-grained analysis. And we fine-tune our microscopes by looking deeper, often aided by virtually gathered data. But that fine-grained analysis only makes sense because we are constantly seeking the larger connections, the pullback connections, comparisons with other villages, other times, places, tethered then untethered by critical theories. We search for the globals within these encounters, that is the sensory pleasures, sounds, tastes, textures that have traveled. Perhaps, but also besides those pleasures, the violations of dignity, human rights, censorship, censorship, cultural appropriation, physical well-being. The global Japan that I envision takes a kind of no holds barred approach to the study of something called Japan writ large, assuming this mantle of critique and even activism that I suggest we share. And in taking Juliana as a framework, I want to acknowledge the kinds of responsibilities that we hold. We take responsibility for those upon whose shoulders we engage in research, the librarians, those who open doors for us, interviewees, institutions that have provided homes, communities who have welcomed us, funding agencies, including Japan Foundation, our various mentors, the conversations and emergent friendships. These form our infrastructure of possibility. Our Kuliana goes beyond the acknowledgments page in our books and articles, but should be paying it forward to future generations of scholars near and far. It includes forming networks of persons and institutions, such as at this conference, and extending across oceans to the richness of participants. The commemoration of 27 years of the Japan Studies Association 
demonstrates both the kuleana of looking back and even more importantly, the agenda of looking forward to ways by which ethics, responsibility and civic engagement may guide the next 27 years and beyond. This then, with Kuleana as the linchpin of global Japan, the linchpin of Japan studies, might create the game plan of transnational connection that is deeply meaningful in its creation and sustenance of dynamic community. We mentor, we listen, we lead, and we do so with a restlessness that constantly seeks new connections to be made, new standards to be held up to conditions that are ever changing. None of us can know the future, not even with our glass, glasses raised half full. But what we can do is to challenge ourselves to do today as well, as responsibly, as humanely as we can. We swim together, stroke by stroke, navigating the transnational waters as we reconfigure Japan studies ever, ever emergent. Thank you. Well, thank you so much uh, to our panelists for those absolutely wonderful presentations. You have proven yourselves indeed uh, to be the dream team. Uh, uh, can I ask you all to switch uh, your cameras on uh, for this uh, closing part of our uh, 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 roundtable? We've got about 30 minutes left. Uh, I just want to say that, uh, uh, as I hope you brought uh, a lot of optimism uh, to your comments, but you also brought the clear recognition that we need to change uh, as a field in our approaches and our mindsets, but also in our own individual research and teaching. And I love the way that the conversation that these uh, papers ran from the extremely pragmatic and the local uh, to the inspiringly metaphorical and global, even cosmic uh, in scale. Uh, we heard strategies, but we also heard uh, calls to action. Uh, uh, I think you all challenged us uh, to think and act in ways uh, that are intellectual and academic, uh, but are also uh, tactical and practical, uh, uh, and at the same time, responsible, to borrow Christine's word, and dare I say it, moral, uh, as we approach uh, the future of our field. These are exciting things and important things for us all to think about and discuss. Let me encourage the audience, if you have questions or comments, please throw them in the box, the chat box now. I'll just uh, uh, sort of prime the pump uh, by asking two or three questions here at the beginning. And I think I'll go ver back very much uh, to that sort of pragmatic uh, end. So I'm gonna ask you uh, about something that I'm guessing uh, just about everyone uh, on this uh, 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 Zoom call uh, have dealt with at some point in their careers. Uh, and that is, what advice do you give to undergraduates who are interested in pursuing a PhD and an academic career in Japanese studies. Do you encourage them? Do you dissuade them? What do you say? How about we start with you, Christine? Yes, I thought I was going last. <laughs> I just sat back and I was gonna to listen to everybody else. Absolutely, I encourage them wholeheartedly. Um, but, I, but I encourage them to, to look broadly. And certainly we have to be Japan specialists. But I think the idea of being a specialist and being a very narrow specialist, we, we need that, right? That's, that's what we write books about. But we need, as, as you know, um, Mindy pointed out, Amanda pointed out so well, we need a broad approach as well. We need to look beyond our special fields. I, I always say anthropologists need history. <laughs> and I encourage anthropologists to take, to take history courses very broadly. Um, and so, yes, I encourage them, sure, uh, Japan studies, absolutely, but do so with open eyes and do so as fully prepared as possible, because the field is not going to come to you, and you have to be prepared to approach the field very broadly. Yeah. Fantastic. Morgan? Sorry, I was taking notes on what Christine said. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, I also encourage people. I think for me, the, the concern is a lack of um, sometimes a lack of understanding 
of uh, just of how much the academic job market has changed and how constrained um, employment opportunities are in higher education. So I think students, there's no question to me, students should continue with Japanese studies and should embrace the study of Japanese language, history, culture, and, and you know, from, from any angle that they can uh, approach it really. But then when the question is, oh, should I go and do an MA? Oh, should I go and do a PhD focusing on Japanese language, Japanese studies? I do, I do encourage people very strongly, but I say, you wanna have two or three career paths in mind. The, the day when you could see academia as a single lane with no off ramps is gone. Uh, and whether you are doing the, the new MA here at uh, UNC Chapel Hill in Asian and Middle Eastern studies, or whether you're doing a PhD in Japanese studies at Harvard, you need to, to know that your chances of getting a job as a college professor are slim. And so embrace the possibilities of being an art consultant, uh, a legal uh, researcher, uh, a museum educator, uh, a translator. There are, there are so many fields in which deep expertise in an important language like Japanese and deep expertise in the culture and history of a country as significant in the past and present as Japan can be useful but boy, you're gonna have a better time if you are planning all along throughout your PhD on doing internships, on doing projects that give you that um, technical training, not just in the academic sphere, but in these other lanes as well. Um, and, and then when you go on the job market, you will feel confident that you have options instead of desperate uh, and bouncing from postdoc to postdoc. Indy? I'm uh, uncharacteristically more pessimistic on this front. <laughs> uh, perhaps it is the reality of my student loan uh, statements <laughs> that arrives uh, each month that really brings home the realities to me. But yeah, I, I frame it as a series of uh, awkward or difficult conversations with students, which does not you know, dissuade them per se, but like lays out the re like Morgan says the realities of employment outlook of the, the being strategic along the way. Um, I remember Bill at the time that I arrived first at KU, you advised me to make world history or uh, world history a secondary field, and I blew you off. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it didn't. But, you know, when I went on the job market, I, I very quickly realized the wisdom of that advice that I failed to take. Um, so I, I just try to say, like, you know, have a conversation with the student that not intended to discourage them, but intended to really sort of probe through the things that they don't know and therefore ha are not considering. Bill, can I just say something? Yeah, I, I think that all of us, is, you know, it's it's embarrassing because Bill, Morgan, um, I mean, we all have tenure track jobs and that is a rare thing these days. And it's not something that we can dangle in front of our students and that would be irresponsible of us. Um, so I'm, I'm with you, Mindy. And I think that it's our responsibility, even if we have uh, tenure track jobs to, to, think, to help our students think outside the box. What might we do? Um, and granted, there are bills to be paid, et cetera. So, so how to think beyond, how to make plan Bs really viable and really attractive to us and really sources of growth. I can't, you know, and I, I know that we, I would be speaking facetiously because I've never done it. So I feel um, a bit inauthentic in that, but I think we do owe it to our students to have this, you know, the serious conversation that, that you're talking about. I think there's still room for a glass half full, but I don't know what it looks like exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is this is the kind of double speak I give to my students and I, um, I'm continually apologizing for that. But um, yeah. I just wanna say, I'm glad I came to y'all's office hours uh, because the tough love and the frankness are deeply appreciated. Uh, let me ask you about uh, a timely issue right now, uh, and that's how you think the pandemic 
uh, is going to affect Japan studies in the US and globally. And I guess I'm particularly interested in how you might think about uh, Japanese uh, uh, restrictions on international travel uh, for students and scholars affecting the field. Uh, we've talked about a new uh, uh, Sakoku uh, in Japan, a new closed country. People have been talking about cruel Japan as opposed to cool Japan uh, to describe the ways uh, that this travel has been blocked. Uh, and I expect uh, there are several people at least uh, on this uh, call today uh, who've had study abroad trips canceled. Uh, or research trips canceled uh, because of the pandemic. So I just wonder uh, what your thoughts are about that and what the long-term impact might be. Morgan, do you want to start? Yeah, sure, I'll jump in. Um, it is, uh, for me, as someone who whose career has been um, focused on the sort of material turn in Japanese studies, deeply uh, discouraging because my work really relies on the study of material culture, the study of, of art objects, uh, objects from daily life, um, the built environment. Uh, increasingly, as I said, I'm interested in cities and also in environmental history. So, you know, rivers and mountains and forests that I, I, I really need to, to visit and treat as primary sources uh, with the kind of reverence that I previously would have treated documents. Um, and and it, it feels like a real blow in some ways to not currently be able to, to, to visit those sites. Um, and so I, I am deeply sympathetic for um, researchers at every stage of their careers who are similarly unable to visit Japan at this moment. And I'm, I'm frustrated uh, with the policies of the Japanese government and I will be advocating alongside Christine in the Japan Foundation meeting soon enough for a generosity and a flexibility that thus far we haven't seen. Actually, that's not in their power, but I will we will advocate with them and they will advocate upward and we'll hope for the best. Um, in the meantime though, I, I am on the other hand, someone who thinks the increasing openness of Japanese institutions to digitizing their collections, the increasing openness of, of um, museums all around the world uh, to digitizing their objects, and even in some cases removing the fees that require that are required to reproduce images of those objects in publications has opened up a lot of opportunities for study. So yes, it's harder to go and um, be a fly on the wall in a ceramic studio in uh, Hagi uh, in Yamaguchi Prefecture, one of my favorite places in the world, and think about the tradition of making ceramics. But there are more uh, Japanese tea bowls that I can study from afar uh, through museum collections all over the world, uh, accessible to me from my computer than ever in the past. Uh, yes, I can't go and interview people in person or do the kind of rich ethnographic work that someone like Christine has built her career on, but we now have access to uh, online forums and fan discussions and new digital modes of engaging that are now academically legitimate, right? I mean, I'm sure many of the people in the audience do sophisticated work in this area. That is work that can be done to a certain degree at a distance remotely, I think with great effects. And just as in the past, um, there, there were many decades when scholars of China relied on primary sources that were available in their libraries and didn't go to China at all and still produced astounding work. I mean, obviously I'm not hoping we enter a phase like that with Japan, but we have to uh, innovate. We have to, um, we have to, to, to go with the flow and, and do what we can with the materials that are available to us. Um, that is a hard pill to swallow if your whole dissertation is built on a set of materials you can't get access to today. And I don't wanna try to deny that in any way. But if anyone is struggling with this issue and I can provide any support at all, reach out and talk to me and I will very gladly uh, give whatever advice I can. The curator of the Japanese collection at the Cleveland Museum of Art has just put the open access link in the <laughs> chat. I mean, these materials are real and uh, we all should be doing our best to teach them and use them in our work. I don't know if you're waiting on me, but I can't, I don't have anything to add that Morgan didn't just say beautifully. So no more <laughs> card catalogs, please. <laughs> <laughs> can I just add something? I mean, you know, the example of, of both the pluses and minuses of this pandemic and the various kinds of shutdowns is, is this conference, right? In which we are able to draw upon people from, from a greater distance than 
would happen otherwise. Of course, people might miss, you know, standing as Bill wanted to do with the Loha shirt and, and slippers on the beach of what you see with his mind. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever your drink is, Bill. <laughs> but at the same time, we are able to have conversations. And, and this kind of, you know, plus and minus is, is really important for us to consider. It's not all minus. It becomes a different form. And, and I think research will continue in Japan, certainly, but it will it will change because there may be assumptions that whoever is going to Japan may have already partaken of the kinds of digital digitized archives that are available. It, 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 but it also makes our work overwhelming, right? I mean, if you start including all the fan blogs, it's like, what? There's this tidal wave and how do you, how do you, you have to, are you still responsible for looking at every little thing? So, you know, the amount of information, as we all know, when, when things go digital, the amount of information expands exponentially, but it gives us amazing opportunities. So thank you. Yeah, I was really struck by how this conversation about uh, the virtual and uh, uh, online connections echoed uh, uh, what uh, Christine was talking about, about the ocean, uh, and that this is our moment to recognize the ocean that ties us together. I've been amazed that I've been on webinar webinars about Japanese studies, I think now from every continent except for uh, Africa, you know, I was in ones in Mexico, ones in uh, 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 Europe, of course, in Asia, uh, uh, Australia, uh, not Antarctica either. But, you know, still, it's been pretty amazing to make these new connections with global scholars at this moment that I don't think I would have otherwise, because at AAS, I would stay within my own little bubble of friends. I am going to take a couple questions now from uh, the uh, audience. And let me start with a, a really uh, uh, interesting uh, question. I think, you know, uh, uh, what uh, Morgan was saying about uh, how uh, 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 positions are filled in the academy uh, is uh, resonated with a lot of us, especially those in history, where we've seen this turnover from hiring based on geography, uh, 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 the old area studies model, uh, to moving now to more thematic uh, hires. Uh, this really is something uh, real, uh, and it is uh, a threat, I think, to our field. Uh, and the question was asked, how do you feel about team teaching as a model uh, for staying with those geographic or area study specialists, but giving uh, uh, students uh, thematic courses? Uh, or what other ideas might you have uh, for uh, 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 making the argument for continuing uh, to make hires based on geographical areas or regions, cultural uh, regions? Well, I mean, team teaching is, is complicated administratively and often also expensive. So a, a lot depends on the institutions. Some institutions have a flexibility. I think often private institutions have a kind of flexibility there that at least in my limited experience, state institutions don't have. Because um, if you have a class of, um, if your normal class size is 35 students with no TAs, and then you want to have two faculty with 35 students, the bean counters get very upset. So um, you have to come up with other models. And actually UNC's College of Arts and Sciences is experimenting with a new form of team teaching um, that is pricey, but the, you know, the higher ups have invested in it. And, and I really hope that it lasts because I think it is a way to create interdisciplinary and thematic connections that are tremendously exciting. Um, I think, uh, I think that it, it, the, these trends in hiring put, I mean, this is, this is going to sound really terrible, but kind of put the onus on us to, to, to demonstrate, to all of us, to demonstrate the relevance of our work without relying on our specialness as Japan experts, right? So a, a grad student today who is training to be an environmental historian of Japan has to be competitive with environmental historians of America, environmental historians of Europe, environmental historians of Latin America and Africa, they, the, they can't just assume that there's a Japan job out there waiting for them. And their work has to be as theoretically rigorous, as grounded in the sources, as relevant to the world we live in as any of those other candidates. Whereas, I mean, I have to admit when I did my PhD, I felt kind of a relief that I wasn't gonna be competing with all the cool Europeanists I know. You know, I, I thought I can't compete with them for jobs uh, and I didn't have to. Uh, and I think today um, people going for thematic positions just have to, uh, they have to be really sharp and it's scary, but 
Um, I hope people will continue to pursue Japan and then go for those thematic positions because the stories that they can tell are different and meaningful. And we don't want to go back to a world where all anybody studies is Europe and America. Well, and I think in terms of training as, as a grad student um, begins to shape their, you know, shape their, what they, what they're bringing to the table going toward the job market. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that would behoove them anyway, regardless of what discipline they're in, right? Because uh, so many people, I mean, I guess I always thought I was destined toward, you know, for a state school, maybe a tier two state school. I thought I saw this as my future, never considered um, that so many private liberal arts colleges would come calling. And in fact, once I got on the job market, that was almost 80% of everybody who wanted to talk to me. Um, and I just didn't have any frame of reference for it. But I think we would do well to prepare students by telling them that you, very likely you will be possibly the only Asianist, not just in your department, possibly at your entire institution, because I know many people for whom that is true. Um, and if there is another Asianist, that person might be in a discipline that you have not even thought that they might be in. Right, so this idea of team teaching and collaborating because we're both scholars of Japan, but like working in very different disciplines can also be a reality and dependent on the, depending on the personalities can be very fruitful or very problematic, I think. Right, but um, that's casting the net broadly and thinking about, you know, these kinds of thematic uh, things, whether it's like working on material culture or working on environmental studies or doing something in the realm of gender studies, for example can be a strategic way to position yourself. Thank you. Uh, Christine, anything to add or should we go to our last question? Great. So uh, we have time for one more, I think. And this is one I think we can all relate to. Uh, can each of the panelists comment briefly on how much they feel that their respective institutions support Japan studies and Asian studies in general? Sometimes I feel that students are interested, but my college, not so much. Uh, and Morgan, you talk to this directly. And I think I wrote down your exact uh, words, institutional support wanes, and that leads to a decline in student interest, uh, which uh, I think there's a lot of wisdom uh, on that. Do you want to talk about that a little bit more? Sure. I mean, I'll just say that this is something that most scholars are not trained to do, and that is to manage up, right? That is to, to go to a dean or to go to a provost or a chancellor or a president and to, to make an argument that is um, legible to them, you know, that, that, that um, sort of uh, engages with the stakes and the metrics that they care about. Uh, and that's very hard to do. In some ways, it's even harder to do at the schools where those arguments are the most desperately needed. Um, I was, uh, I had the chance to go in and review an Asian studies department at a, 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 a state university that I won't name that was under threat. And I was paired with, an, with another scholar from a tier one research university. And we both understood exactly what we were, what we were doing. And we tried so hard to provide a set of metrics that would be legible to those administrators and to say, this department is doing all this great work. The students want more of this. And I don't think it was successful. I think the department ended up being dissolved and it was gutting, it was heart-wrenching. And um, I, think, I think it's also a mistake because I think students, uh, even in pre-professional fields who are armed with knowledge about Japan, Japanese language, Japanese culture and history will do better and will have more opportunities and will make the world a better place, frankly. So it harms the uh, outcomes of the students, it harms the attractiveness of that curriculum, it harms the, the long-term um, you know, efficacy of the, of the work of the university to shut down um, Asian studies programs or, or not to build them in the first place. So we have to go in and, and use the data that we can collect to make arguments that our administrators will listen to. And I mean, I was trained to read medieval documents and look at tables. I wasn't trained to do that. So I've tried to really hard to learn. Um, I mean, Bill here is one of the best in the business and there are a lot of others who have had success doing that kind of work. Um, I, I, and it's not fun, but I think it is necessary. 
It, it's not fun being on the other end either, Morgan. I'll tell you that. Uh, you know, we all tend to like, you know, scowl when we say the dean or the provost or the president. Uh, and uh, having sat in those chairs, uh, it's tough making those kind of decisions uh, when, you know, there are great arguments. For, exactly. There are great arguments uh, for all the programs we consider part of the liberal arts today, while meanwhile, STEM uh, and new intellectual approaches keep our perspectives growing, you know? And so how do you accommodate that? Christine? Yeah, well, I was going to suggest that Bill, as president now of two colleges, that you hold a workshop to teach us <laughs> academics how to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Or, you know, I might have a workshop to on it, how to read my non-committal answers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it, it astonishes me, even at a place like the University of Hawaii, where you would think Asian studies is vibrant and strong, and it is to a certain extent, it's under constant threat. Even my position in, what, 1997, when I got hired, even my position was going to be cut when Takia Libra retired. Uh -huh. And it was only by petition of her former students, including myself, wow. for the position wow. that I got. So, you know, it's longstanding. And, and it, it, is, it, it is a real threat. And it's always seems to be about being counting and has very little relationship to the communities that uh, these universities are supposed to serve, unfortunately. I, I don't have a lot of really substantive to add, but I will say that one way I feel that my department is protecting itself from the constant threat we all feel. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're kind of, we're trying to entice students, we're keeping our enrollments up, and we're, you know, putting on a good PR show, but that alone isn't enough. I think in the end, what we have done very effectively here, um, and I think does give us some measure of security, is we have found ways in which our program uniquely services the overall curriculum in ways that other departments are unable to do because for example we have a global learning um, we have a global learning uh, requirement for graduation that very few other courses satisfy outside of East Asian studies and we are servicing probably 80 percent of that credit for graduation um, and we've also invested very deeply in our uh, institutional wide writing curriculum. And these provide us some measure of relief just because if they if they cut if they cut the program, uh, they would lose a lot of the courses that service those needs and students need those courses to graduate. Um, so it's you know it's not much but it's what we've got. So we're kind of let you know leveraging that as well. Well, you know, uh, I sort of hate to end on this kind of very pragmatic note uh, that sort of ends on campuses and tactics uh, and so forth, but I hope people will see uh, 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 the promise in the conversation today. Uh, and the uh, glass half full we've mentioned uh, so many times, there is still so much good uh, in our field and so much opportunity uh, to leverage that into uh, uh, even uh, uh, more uh, meaningful uh, and important things uh, going forward. I want to thank you all. Uh, I know you can't join me uh, in thanking our speakers, but know that I am giving them uh, my equivalent of a Zoom standing uh, ovation uh, for their comments today. Thank you to the audience uh, for being here. Uh, please uh, take some of this to heart uh, and act on what uh, you heard. I know I'll be thinking about it uh, and doing that. Thank you to the JSA. There are plenty of panels left today on language learning, on the Ainu, on international relations uh, and politics, and a roundtable on Hokkaido. And of course, there's a full day tomorrow. Please stay tuned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, have a great conference. <laughs>